Good morning and welcome to the Anchor Church. We are live here in the Myatt's Garage in Carlsbad, California. So hopefully you are clued in and you're live and able to get on here. Um, we are going to sing three songs this morning. So we would love that you would join us. So here we go. One, two, three. Stronger, the King of Glory. 
Sometimes I'm strong, sometimes I'm weak, sometimes I fall in my wandering. But through it all, there's just one thing more precious than So Kyle has a very steady hand, so I'm not going up and down, right? <laughs> okay, come into our house. We have Aloha. You are welcome to come in. And we're so glad you could join us this morning. Because there's a lot of choices out there for churches. And we're glad that you have came to see us and be involved in our Anchor Hour. And we think that you'll be glad you did. It sounds kind of like an airline commercial, isn't it? So thank you for choosing us. We're glad you did. So in my reading this morning, I wanted to um, share with you a quote that I came across. And it's by Corey Ten Boom. And it was very inspiring. It says, if you look at the world, you will be distressed. 
if you look within, you will feel depressed. But if you look at God, you will be at rest. And I thought that was why Rick is teaching about the character of God. Because we have to look at him in order to um, know how to navigate this life. So it's really amazing to think that what we think about God is, is going to be how we live out our life. It's essential in how we navigate and then how we love each other, even in this COVID times with all the disagreement. So um, this morning, Rick is going to be talking about God's grace, that it is enough in all of this. So his chapter, turn to um, chapter 2 Corinthians, uh, chapter 11, verse 30, we're going to start, and the title of his um, sermon is No More Bookkeeping. So Rick, and he's going to come and clip that. Well, good morning, Anchor Church. So, repeated, uh, reportedly, um, our governor has recently learned that Jesus said that where two or three are gathered in his name, he would be with them. He's now concerned that that's going to make too large of a group, so he's uh, going to um, consider abandoning Christians gathering in groups that size. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, let's not start a rumor. Um, I did hear, however, the governor is concerned about the studies that show that by flushing a toilet, you can actually spread the, the coronavirus. And in light of this, the governor is thinking of banning flushing of toilets. Uh, kidding again. Uh, maybe you can do it with a remote device you can set up. Uh, you could you know, wait till you get out of the room and then flush the toilet. But of course, then the room would be, have to be closed for the next 90 minutes, uh, whatever. And I wonder if you could create a, uh, an ultraviolet light for the bathroom that would kill the, uh, well, anyway. I suspect if the governor ever allows churches to meet again, he'll probably insist, continue to insist on banging, banning singing. And I was thinking about that, that, well, I guess we'll all have to lip sync, but then if we're wearing masks, you won't be able to see that either. So uh, maybe that's not going to help. There actually isn't much uh, that's very funny about the coronavirus these days as it's uh, become a even greater threat as it's spreading. Uh, I can tell you from our own son that things are, uh, getting pretty crazy in emergency rooms uh, and hospitals. Um, you know, I got to tell you that I hate wearing the face masks, but um, I want to encourage you to do that. Uh, there's a recent study that was revealed that said if everyone wore them, uh, we could cut coronavirus deaths by 58% by the fall. Um, uh, Toby, our son, told us that it probably could cut transmission of the disease by 80% if people would wear their face masks whenever they're in public. So I want to encourage you to uh, wear your face mask as much as we might not like it. Um, while there's currently no timetable for worship services resuming, the leaders of our church are um, thinking about how we might be able to at least provide some opportunity for people to get together um, and just fellowship and maybe just encourage one another. So we're working on that, looking at that. So I want to encourage you to pray for us, give us wisdom and guidance on how we can do that. So let's, uh, before we get into God's word, let's take a, a moment and let's pray. Father, uh, we know that you are a sovereign God and that you know all things. You know the end from the beginning and you've known about coronavirus since uh, before the world began. And so none of this is a surprise to you. It's as you know, Lord, been quite a shock for us and disoriented for us. We've never been through anything like this. We don't know where this is going. It's disconcerting at best. And so, Father, um, we look to you as our sovereign God and we trust in you during these times. We learned last week that you are in control. And so what we need to do is just trust you. And we pray you'll enable us to do that. I pray you'll give us peace as we go through these times. But Lord, we do pray that uh, there would be some answers to this uh, virus that uh, we might be able to return to a somewhat more normal life soon. Uh, we pray this most recent surge would die down quickly. And um, Lord, we just pray for, I guess, a vaccine would be developed or people to somehow become immune to this thing. 
and that uh, life could re return to normal. We pray that our economy won't be absolutely destroyed by all that's been going on and uh, bring on greater misery, Lord. And so in the meantime, Lord, I pray that you'll help us to be strong, uh, to be at peace in you, and to be a source of grace and encouragement for others. And Lord, we pray that this morning you'll teach us through your word as we consider looking at what you are really like according to your word. And we pray this in the name of our Lord Jesus. Amen. So we have some new neighbors moved in just across the street, and uh, they're a delightful young couple. They have a little toddler daughter. Uh, recently, we've noticed quite a bit of noise coming from their house, and it turns out the husband was doing some kind of project in his garage, so he was using power saw out there a lot, and that's what we were hearing. After several days, I, I grew curious about what he was up to, so one day when he was out there working, I walked over and I said, hey, Michael, uh, what are you doing? And uh, he's he's making cabinets for his garage. Um, he's doing a good job. He's about halfway done, actually now a little bit more. He wanted to fix up the garage, but he said, you know, to buy cabinets was so expensive, he just decided he would do it himself. <laughs> uh, you know, it was funny yesterday, I noticed a lot of work, do-it-yourself work going on around our neighborhood. You know, Michael was out there, he was working on his thing. Mark, a few doors down the street, some of you know, is building a, a patio cover. He was out in his driveway working on that stuff. And then his next door neighbor was building a table. He was working on it. And, and I felt very inferior because I can't do any of that stuff. Um, I actually shudder at the words, do it yourself, because I can't. Um, it was funny when I was talking to Michael about his project, he happened to mention learning some of the things he was doing when he was in shop and cl shop class in junior high. And I remembered it kind of touched on a sore spot. I had shop class when I was in junior high. Uh, I had metal shop as a seventh grader and wood shop as an eighth grader. And I remember in wood shop, they tried to come up with a project they figured that anybody could do without injuring themselves. And so the big project was we made a cutting board. A cutting board is just a board. <laughs> you know, it doesn't take a lot of work. The amazing thing is I even managed to foul that up. I, I passed the class, but I, I passed mainly because I didn't cut off any fingers and didn't have to go to the ER to get stitches. So um, I, I have this sense of inferiority because of my inability to accomplish anything like that. Um, writer John Eldridge said that all men fear that they don't have what it takes to do all that life demands of them, and they feel like they're faking it to get through. When I read that, it was a relief, because that's how I feel. There's so many things that I feel inadequate for in life, um, and I thought maybe I was the only one. Nice to know that everybody feels like that, not just guys, but everybody. Um, and it, it's not just about woodworking or mechanical ability or sports or job issues. We know that deep down, in some crucial ways, we don't measure up. And we fall short and we feel the guilt of our shortcomings, our failings. We spend our lives futilely trying to shore them up, hide them, and prove that they're not real when in fact they are. Well, today... We're going to look at a characteristic of God that actually speaks directly to that reality. Um, we're going to be looking at uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 11, as Lori said, verse 30. I have to get a Bible. Down through chapter 12, verse 10. I should have had that ready before we started. So 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 11, Paul, the Apostle Paul, wrote these great words. If I must boast, I will boast of the things that show my weakness. Uh, the God and Father of the Lord Jesus Christ, who is to be praised forever, knows that I am not lying. In Damascus, the governor under King Aretas had the city of Damascus guarded in order to arrest me. But I was lowered in a basket from a window in the wall and slipped through his hands. I must go on boasting, although there is nothing to be gained. 
I will go on to visions and revelations from the Lord. I, I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago was caught up to the third heaven. Whether, whether it was in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows. And I know that this man, whether in the body or apart from the body, I do not know, but God knows, was caught up to paradise. He heard inexpressible things, things that man is not permitted to tell. I will boast about a man like that, but I will not boast about myself except about my weakness. Even if I should choose to boast, I would not be a fool because I would be speaking the truth, but I refrain so no one will think more of me than is warranted by what I do or say. To keep me from becoming conceited because of these surpassingly great revelations, there was given me a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan, to torment me. Three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me, but he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly um, about my weaknesses, so that Christ's power may rest on me. That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weakness and insults and hardships and persecutions and difficulties, for when I am weak, then I am strong. So, um, what we see here is that Paul first learned what not to boast in. You know, in 11.30 he wrote, If I must boast, I will boast of the things that show my weakness. Well, you know, why should he have to boast? You know, is there ever a time in your life when you must boast? I suppose maybe if you're applying for a job and you need, you're trying to convince the uh, employers that while you may not be the fourth member of the Trinity, you are related to them, you might boast. But uh, other than that, boasting seems about as necessary as going to great lengths to explain to people why you wore the particular socks you wore in a given day. Not needed, not interesting. So why did Paul felt like he must boast? Well, uh, there's a couple of aspects of that uh, answer to that question. The first has to do with the, the nature of the Corinthian Christians. Uh, they had an inferiority complex because Athens wasn't too far away, and Athens at that time, though Rome was the center of power, Athens was still regarded as kind of the world-renowned center of intellectual learning and philosophy. Athens was famous. Everyone had respect for Athens. Corinth, on the other hand, was known as the worldwide leader in debauchery and sexual excess. Uh, it, what happened in Corinth stayed in Corinth, was kind of how it went. Um, it, and that made them feel kind of inferior, and so they did what people who have uh, that in, sense of inferiority tend to do, and that is to try to prove that they were impressive, to prove that they were as good as Athens, even though they weren't. So they boasted a lot about everything. You see this repeatedly in the both letters of Corinthians, this boasting thing comes up all the time about just about everything. Not only did they like to boast, but oddly, they wanted leaders who were boastful. They respected that. They thought, well, a leader ought to be somebody who could stand up and talk about his great accomplishments and boast about them. And Paul actually was under attack and he had to defend himself, so that's why he kind of had to boast. He was essentially defending his ministry in his boasting. Um, and that's an unfortunate kind of practical aspect to the boasting. But there is another underlying aspect that's a more important one for us today. And that has to do with um, the fact that when Paul talked about boasting, what he's really talking about is what he has confidence in. In Philippians 3.3, Paul wrote, For it is we who, who are the circumcision, who serve God by his Spirit, who boast in Christ Jesus and who put no confidence in the flesh. When he said he boasted in Christ Jesus, it didn't mean I brag about Jesus. He meant I put my confidence in him and not in the flesh. In other words, not in what I can produce in my own strength. I only rely on Jesus. I'm, and that's what he meant by boasting. And so the big issue really in this part of 2 Corinthians is about what one relies on and what one puts confidence in. And Paul does an odd thing. He makes a statement that he puts confidence in the things that show his weakness. And that's a very unusual thing for a human being to do. You know, um, people don't put confidence in things that they're weak in. You know, when I, my son was in high school, for his last two years, I actually coached his uh, high school hockey team. 
And uh, one of the things that was interesting to me in, in practice was the kids, the, high, the kids I was coaching always wanted to work on and do the things they were already good at, or at least felt they were good at. They, they would run and repeat those things because they felt competent at them, whereas as a, co as a coach, I wanted them to do the things they weren't good at so they could get better at them. Uh, but human nature is, I want to go to the things that I'm good at, not I want to talk about and emphasize and focus on the things I'm weak in. And so, but Paul says this weird thing, I want to talk about those things, boast about those things, focus on the things that display my weakness. And the one that he identifies is something that happened to him in the city of Damascus. And you know the story, Paul was on his way to Damascus to persecute Christians when he uh, was confronted by the risen Lord Jesus Christ. And suddenly he, um, he turned and became the, the, uh, the greatest proponent of Jesus. He went from opponent to proponent of Jesus. And uh, he began telling everybody that he could about, about Jesus and about their need to, to believe in Jesus. Well, this caused a reaction. Uh, there was an active plot hatched in part by the local governor uh, to kill Paul. And so Paul had to be smuggled out of town. They, they smuggled him, put him out through a window into a big basket and lowered him over the city walls to get outside the city and to get away. Now, um, when I was a kid, I, uh, I was taught that story, and it was a story of heroism about Paul's great courage and how he was so courageous in his faith he, um, he had to be smuggled out of town and he was rescued and it was, you know, all that. But Paul says this was a sign of his weakness. Uh, why, why would Paul say it displayed his weakness? Well, because <clears throat> Paul, after being the leading enemy of Christ on the planet, suddenly became the leading fanatical follower of Christ and he wanted to use all of his abilities to convince the Jewish people that lived in Damascus to believe in Jesus, that he was their Messiah. And he was brilliant. He could run theological circles around anyone when it came to the Hebrew Scriptures. In Acts 9.22, it says, He grew more and more powerful and baffled the Jews living in Damascus by proving that Jesus is the Messiah. He beat them all in arguments. And not only that, he not only had his great arguments, but he had his own personal experience. Uh, you know, Acts 9.21 says, All those who heard him were astonished and asked, Isn't he the man who raised havoc in Jerusalem among those who call on this name? And hasn't he come here to take them as prisoners, the chief priests? You know, Paul's turnaround from opponent of Jesus to believer in Jesus was dramatic. You know, so imagine this. Uh, it, it's going to be hard to imagine, but, but try it. Imagine that Nancy Pelosi suddenly comes out and says, Donald Trump is a great president. Donald Trump is what America needs. You need to vote for Donald Trump. Um, you expect that to happen anytime soon? Yeah, me neither. That's just, that would be shocking. Well, what happened with Paul was more shocking than that. And he thought telling his story would, would convince everybody to believe in Jesus. He was certain that his strength, his ability to argue the scriptures, his own personal experience, was going to be a powerful weapon, a powerful tool to convince everybody to believe in Jesus. And all he did was make people so mad at him, they wanted to shut him up and kill him. His evangelistic ministry fell flat on its face. And he saw the whole incident <clears throat> as a terrible embarrassment. It was a loud message that he had failed and failed badly. Now, Paul said that's one thing he could have boasted in, but he, he moves off of that in chapter 12 and moves on in his boasting. He says, I, I must boast some more, but I'm going to boast about something else. In chapter uh, 1, he says, I must go on boasting. And so he starts talking about this man. He says, I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago was caught up in the third heaven. This man was caught up to paradise, heard inexpressible things, things a man's not permitted to tell. In other words, he, he saw things that you cannot explain in human language. Uh, 
Uh, now, there have been a lot of people in the last few years that have come out and they've had near-death experiences and they've talked about being in heaven, seeing what heaven is like, and they've written books and they've gone, been speaking about that. You know, there's one problem with that. They had near-death experiences. They weren't dead. So I don't know what they experienced, um, but they weren't dead and they weren't actually in heaven. Paul says this man actually was ushered into heaven and saw what heaven is actually like. Um, you know, that guy has something to boast about, don't you think? Uh, man, today he'd have a best-selling book out. He'd be on the speaker circuit. He'd be on all the talk shows. This would be something big news. Uh, who was this unnamed guy? Well, in verse 7, Paul said, In order to keep me from becoming conceited. He was the guy. He was the guy who was ushered into heaven and sought, shown heaven by God himself. And he could have become conceited about that. He could have had something to really boast about because nobody else has had that experience. Um, so he could have built a whole ministry on that, telling people about what he saw in his tour of heaven. And so God said, well, I'm going to keep you from becoming conceited. Paul said he was given a thorn in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me. So this thing really bothered him. Yeah, well, you know, a thorn, that can really hurt. You get a thorn in your foot or in your hand, it really hurts. Yeah, you know what? That doesn't really capture the, the spirit of the thing here. The Greek word that's translated uh, thorn actually often is translated spike or stake and was used as an instrument of uh, torment or torture. So whatever this thing was, and Paul never tells us what it was. Uh, scholars have debated what the thorn was, but I think we need to notice that Paul didn't tell us because whatever it was, the identity of it wasn't important. What was important is what it did. Uh, Paul was tormented by this thing. It bothered him, probably caused him, it might have been physical, caused him some pain, but it also caused him distress uh, because he felt like it would uh, limit his ministry. One scholar said the spike was made the subject of ridicule or invidious comparison. Uh, in his commentary on 2 Corinthians, David Garland wrote, Paul thought that this stake would stymie the effectiveness of his ministry. Um, you know, like many of you, I have uh, suffered uh, damage, sun, skin damage from uh, the unwise exposure to the sun in my younger days. And so every couple of years, and when I visit the doctor, they, they use liquid nitrogen to freeze off spots on my face where the, that could turn into skin cancer if they weren't treated. And unfortunately, there have been a, several times where I've had that happen and I've had to go on Sunday morning to, to preach with all these scabs all over my face. And it bothers me because I think people are going to be, instead of listening to what I say, are going to be looking at all that on my face saying, whoa, what happened to him? Uh, would be distracting. And that's what Paul was concerned about with this spike. Um, he thought that the spike might cause God to say, oh, right, uh, God gave you a personal tour of heaven. You bet. If that's true, if God likes you more than other people, then how come he let you have this gnarly spike thing. I mean, that thing is ugly, you know, it's bad. Um, it's hard to believe you're God's special buddy. So that, he was concerned about that. So um, God gave him that spike, allowed Satan actually to inflict it on him, specifically to keep him from boasting. And that brings us to the real climax of this passage, and that is that Paul learned what to boast in. He learned what not to boast in, but he also learned what he should boast in. Uh, God, uh, Paul pleaded with God to take away that spike. He did so repeatedly and nothing. God didn't answer. And after uh, several times, finally God answered, but he didn't answer by taking the spike away. Instead, he said this, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Paul, you don't need superior intellect, powerful debating ability, an astonishing story, awesome revelations for me to use you for my purposes. All you need is my grace. And all that other stuff 
actually gets in the way. You just need grace. Okay, grace. What is grace? Well, it's some kindness that we don't earn, but it is actually given to us as a gift. <coughs> Excuse me. You know, our mortgage payment on our house is due on the first of every month. But as long as our, that payment is in by the 15th of the month, our, our lender doesn't count it as late. So those two weeks are called a grace period. I don't earn them. I don't deserve them. They're just given to me out of kindness. And that's grace. Okay, but grace, how does that apply here in this situation, in this passage? Well, Paul says God told him, my grace, my undeserved kindness to you, is sufficient for you. Sufficient to do what? Well, um, to do whatever we need to do in order for us to be and to do what God wants us to be. So this has two aspects to it. First of all, it has to do with actually being accepted by God and being in a relationship with him where he loves us, forgives us, and counts us as part of his kingdom forever. Um, that's something we need to be. And God says, my grace is sufficient for you to be able to be in that kind of a situation. And then it is to do my will, same thing. My grace is sufficient. Uh, those are two important aspects of grace. Um, God gives that. He gives what is sufficient for us because that is his nature. 1 Peter 5.10 tells us that he is the God of all grace. That's a crucial aspect of God's character. Moses asked to see God's glory, and God gave him a glimpse of it. And in Exodus 34.6, it describes God this way, The Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness. He is gracious. It is his character to give grace. And his grace applies to us in those two ways. First, it gains us acceptance and approval by God. And second, it makes us, it enables us to do what is absolutely necessary for us to do God's will. All those by grace. So let's think about that for a minute. Um, begins with grace that we might be actually connected to God, be loved by him, accepted by him, and be included in his kingdom. You know, we've seen... In earlier weeks, we've been studying God's character is that he's holy and just. And that's a problem for us because on our own, we will never be able to meet his standards of perfect holiness and justice. Uh, the late Haddon Robinson, who was a seminary professor, used to say that one of our struggles that, that all of us have is that we have what he called a bookkeeping mentality. It's cooked into our nature. It's always a part of us lurking somewhere in our brains. And that bookkeeping, if you think about it, bookkeeping, you know, there are assets and there are liabilities. If you're going to succeed, your assets have to exceed your liabilities. And that's how we think it works with God. God will evaluate our account. And if our assets exceed our liabilities, then we're accepted and he loves us and we're in his kingdom. Um, it was interesting. I, I recently read an article about a guy named Chris Pronger, who was a professional hockey player and he was one of the best. Uh, he was a fearsome defenseman. He won a Stanley Cup, and he won uh, two gold medals in the Olympics with the Canada. Uh, he was a perennial all-star in the National Hockey League, and he was one year was the MVP, the most valuable player in the league. He was talented, but he was also known as one of the roughest and dirtiest players ever to play the game. He was six feet, six inches tall, weighed 220 pounds, and he delivered thunderous checks uh, some of them legal and some illegal. And he was known for using his stick to whack people repeatedly. He was suspended for dirty play on eight different occasions. Well, the interesting thing is Chris Pronger's career came to an end when, ironically, his eye was injured by an opponent's stick, um, and he took several hits to his head that gave him a concussion so severe that uh, bright lights would bring on a severe headache. And then he, if he tried to throw a baseball back and forth with his young son for very long, it would cause him dizziness. Ended his career. Um, the article said Pronger takes full responsibility for his choices and he isn't looking for grace. He said, I stuck some guys good. 
And I'm guessing a few guys around the league heard about my injuries and started thinking, ah, sweet karma. I didn't play the game to make friends. I played to win. If what happened to me is a byproduct of that, I accept it. I'd be a hypocrite to ask for sympathy now. He's essentially saying, I got what I deserved. And a lot of people actually said exactly what he thought. Well, how appropriate that a guy who hurt a lot of people with dirty play had his career ended with some questionable hits. Uh, it seems right and fair that a guy who succeeded by pounding people, intimidating people, ended up being hurt by being pounded and intimidated by someone. That's how a bookkeeping system works. You get what you deserve. Um, you're, and if your liabilities are so great uh, that they insist you deserve to be punished, then you should be punished. But that's the problem. Uh, justice for us is a disaster when we are evaluated by the divine bookkeeper. Unfortunately, there is something actually inside of every human being that actually taints, at least to some degree, even our assets. Um, the Bible says even our righteousness is as filthy rags to God because it's tainted by something that's distorted inside all of us human beings. Uh, that's so true that if we could actually see our assets for what they are, we would turn, find out that our assets turn out to be liabilities. So here's the problem. When you, uh, what happens when you have nothing in your asset column but everything in your liability column? Well, you're bankrupt. Spiritually speaking, before God, we're bankrupt. And if we're going to do bookkeeping and we get what we deserve, we're in serious trouble. You know, there wasn't a moment in Paul's life where he forgot that reality. He felt the reality of his own bankruptcy because he had blatantly, openly, undeniably committed terrible crimes he had injured severely and intentionally God's people. He had been an enemy of God himself, and he knew it. There was no excuse. There was no hiding it. There was no way to get away from it. And so he called himself the chief of sinners. If there was a sinner's club, he was the president. Now, uh, he knew if he got what he deserved, his, the fate was going to be awful. Now, <clears throat> you know what? I'm... Uh, I'm not the worst of sinners. I know that's true. Uh, I think most people would say, I, I'm probably not even one of the club officers in the sinners club. Um, but I know sadly, I am in fact a card-carrying member of the club. I wish I weren't, but I know I am. All of us are. You know, we went through, we've gone through an interesting little uh, uh, journey here. Lori, uh, had to have her driver's license renewed this year and uh, so she wanted to get a real ID. Um, well, turns out that in order for her to, her to do that, we had to have, because her name from her birth certificate is different from her birth certificate because she got married to me, we had to have a copy of the, our marriage certificate and we discovered we don't have a certified copy of our marriage certificate. So we thought, okay, well, we need to get one so that we, uh, that Lori then can get her real ID. So. We uh, had to get a notarized uh, request to the uh, Orange County clerk. We got married in Fullerton up in Orange County. We sent a notarized request to get a copy of our, our marriage certificate. We were dismayed. We got a response from them a couple of weeks later that said they have no record of our wedding. We, we were shocked. We thought, ah, uh, what happened here? Uh, but then I noticed on the, our, on the, uh, rec the thing they sent back, their reply, that uh, you have to apply to the county that you, not that you got married in, but that you applied for the license in. And we thought, oh, you know what? We must have applied for it in the L.A. County because we lived, Lori lived actually in L.A. County at the time. We thought, oh, we probably got it in L.A. County. So we sent in a notarized request to L.A. County. For, the, uh, for our marriage certificate. Well, we, a few weeks later, we got a reply from them. They had no record of it either. And we thought, uh-oh, we have a problem. Where's our marriage certificate? Nobody has a record of it. We thought, could something have gone wrong and we've been living together in sin all these years that we're not actually married? You know, 
And then I was looking at their the reply from the LA County and uh, Lori's maiden name was Lori Bingham and they had said, we have no record of a marriage for Lori Bringham and Richard Myatt. Uh, and we realized they searched for the wrong name. And so I, you know what, I got so down. You know those bureaucrats, man, they're, how, how hard is it to just copy a name down wrong, search for the right name and uh, so dumb, you know, that they couldn't even get her name right. And so I got really down on those people in Los Angeles, the bureaucrats that can't seem to do their job, <laughs> brother. Um, so we thought, well, what do we do now? We, we, you know, there probably is a record of it, but we don't want to appeal to them because they won't get it right. But they had said, well, you can apply to the state public health department and they'll have a record of it. So we thought, okay. So once again, another notarized request to state public health department uh, for a copy of our marriage certificate. Uh, this past week, we got one. Lori, actually, here she went up and got it. Here it is. Yeah. Got, got our uh, marriage certificate. We're actually married. Um, and uh, we thought, oh, great. Okay, that's good. And, but I, just a couple of days ago, I was just looking over the certificate, and I just noticed there's a box in here that says, County of Issue of License, Kern. Uh, oh. We, we applied for it in Kern County when we were up in Bakersfield visiting, and I had completely forgotten that. I still have no recollection of applying for that license in Bakersfield, but apparently that's where we applied for it. So here's the thing. I was so high and mighty getting down on these bureaucrats because they, they couldn't find our marriage certificate. And the, where the problem was? Right here. I'm the one who made the mistake, who forgot that we actually got our license from Kern County. There's that thing in us that's so quick to be able to find fault with other people, look down on other people, to judge other people. There's something inside of us that's so focused on self that actually turns everything we do into something about self. You know, when you see a picture uh, what, that you're in, what do you look for first? Me. Yeah, we're so obsessed with self and it is that, that little distortion and everything's about me that touches even the good things that we do. And it turns them into liabilities. So here's the reality. We have no assets to offer. However, Paul, remember, understood he deserved condemnation and judgment from God. Instead, what he got was forgiveness and kindness. In 1 Timothy 1.14, he said, the grace of our Lord was poured out on me abundantly along with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. Through Jesus Christ, we have received kindness from God and forgiveness. And that is what makes us acceptable to God. That's what includes us in his kingdom. Nothing we do makes us acceptable to God. It is only that God's grace is sufficient for that and nothing else is. So that's the first way we experience God's grace. The second way, as I mentioned, is um, being able to do what God wants us to do. You know, Paul wanted to be used powerfully by God, but in order for that to happen, he had to learn that what would, what would make him able to actually effectively minister the gospel of Jesus Christ to people was not his argumentation, not his theology, not his experiences, not his revelations. It was one thing. It was the grace of God. Um, you know, uh, I recall a day many years ago, I was out in our garage. I had some uh, workout uh, exercise equipment out there. I was lifting weights. Now, uh, one of the things I had was a weight bench that had stanchions that you could put a barbell up on so you could do a bench press. So I was out there working out, and Toby was out in front playing with a couple of his buddies. He was about nine years old at the time. And uh, while I was in the middle of my workout, at one point, the boys came in. And they said, hey, we want to try doing the bench press. I said, okay. Um, well, let me put the bar up on the supports for you. And they said, no, no, we want to pick it up. I said, I, you know, it's kind of heavy. It had about 70 pounds on it at that point. Um, and they, they said, 
no, no, we want to do it. And I said, okay. So uh, one of them came over and tried to pick that thing up. He couldn't even budge it, couldn't get it off the ground at all. So then two of them went to the one end and, and together they tried to lift one end of the bar up and they got it a few inches off the ground. That was as far as they got. And then they said, yeah, maybe you better lift it up. So I just naturally just picked it up very easily and just set it up on the stanchion. As long as those boys were relying upon their abilities, they were never going to get that barbell up on that stanchion, of those stanchions. They had to stop using their ability and let my power take over and then the task got accomplished. And that's exactly what Paul, what God said to Paul. You need to quit relying on your cleverness, your ability, your strengths, and you need to trust in my grace. Um, you know, um, in, uh, the Christians often refer to spiritual gifts as things that are important for us to be able to minister to other people. But the, the term that's translated gifts is an important one. It, the Greek term was charisma. We get our word charisma from it. Um, one of the things you need to know about Greek is that when you see the, an ending of a word, M-A, the ma on the end of a word in Greek, that meant the result of. And so charisma is the, the result of charis. Well, what's charis? It's grace. A gift is the result of grace. And so as Paul, the, the point of that is whenever we're able to do anything that ministers to someone effectively that God, has, uh, God wants us to do, it is a charisma. It is a result of grace. Paul seemed to be the perfect person to minister to Jewish people and convince them to believe in Jesus as their Messiah. He had, the, he had the knowledge, he had the arguing ability, he had the experiences, he had the revelations. And so do you know what God did? He said, Paul, I'm going to send you to the Gentiles where all of his knowledge of the Hebrew Scriptures would be useless you know, when Paul would talk about the Hebrew Scriptures and how Jesus fulfilled them to Gentiles, all he would get was blank stares. When he talked about how he was uh, uh, converted from being a hater of Christ into being a, a follower of Christ to a Gentile, it was, well, you went from being a part of one Jewish sect to another Jewish sect. So what? Um, his experiences were of no use, and all he could do was rely upon the grace of God. And Second Corinthians, uh, or in First Corinthians two two, uh, he told the Corinthians that he resolved to know nothing while I was with you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. He came to the Corinthians, and all he could do was tell them this story: that God became a man, the one true God became a man, walked among us, died on our behalf, and then rose from the dead. And it was an absurd story. And the only reason that people believed it was the grace of God was at work. Writer and former pastor John Piper says, God's grace is God's power, provision, mercy, and wisdom, everything we need to do what he wants us to do. As I think about a difficult phone call I have to make or about getting out of bed or of enduring another day of sickness, I shouldn't think that I'm going to be left alone for that. There's going to be grace sufficient for every good deed. So, what do we do with this? How do we apply this to our lives? Well, first of all, believe that no one is beyond the grace of God. You know, as I've been talking today, there may be some who said, yeah, you know, uh, that business just relying on God to be kind to us, that sounds too good to be true. You know, there is no free lunch and that sounds like a free lunch to me. Well. Here's the thing, lunch wasn't free. It was extremely costly. But Jesus Christ paid the price. He picked up the tab. That was the point of his death. But that means that the tab has been paid. There's nothing left to pay. There's only receiving the gift that he offers. And we re need to remember uh, that that is true. That there's, some might think, well, there's no way that could include me. God could never forgive me and what I have done. But we need to remember the example of Paul. He helped imprison, beat, and even kill followers of Christ. 
He was literally an enemy of God, but he was not beyond the reach of God's grace, and neither are any of us. I suspect that none of us have done anything as bad as what he has done, and God's grace reached him. We also need to remember this is true for other people as well. You know, no one is a lost cause because no one is beyond the grace of God. You know, I have to tell you, I have a couple of friends uh, about whom I am terribly grieved because they are madly, fervently pursuing death by running away from God. And I hate what I see happening to them. It's so much so it's hard for me to see it to the point where it's like I, I feel like I just want to write them off. I don't want to have to deal with it because it's just so painful. But here's the thing. They are not beyond the grace of God. And we should keep praying for them and caring about them because who knows what the grace of God will do in their lives. So do that, first of all. And second, we need to trust God's grace for every need in our lives. God's grace is sufficient. Do you believe that? Um, How different we will be when we operate out of that truth. Whatever comes my way, no matter how inadequate I might feel, um, my adequacy is not the point. I am inadequate. That's why Jesus Christ came and died on a cross. But it doesn't matter. God's grace is sufficient. It unleashes power that I cannot begin to measure. So at every moment of life, we can be hopeful no matter what is going on in our life because what God supplies is enough. Maybe you've heard that somewhere before. Former pastor and best-selling author John Piper again says that when he was a teenager, he was so terrified of ever having to talk in front of people that he literally could not get words out of his mouth in any normal way. He was utterly paralyzed by that. He said it was so bad, it kept him from a lot of activities that it was horribly humiliating for him as as a young man. He said it turned out that all of the embarrassment, all the humiliation, all the loneliness that came with that was necessary for him. It taught him to seek God, to not seek popularity, to find peace and joy in knowing God. And all of that prepared him of all things to be a pastor and to find out that God's grace was sufficient for even that. He said standing in front of people as a pastor was a huge statement of God's grace in his life. He says, I have seen the grace of God in my life and I am glad. He took what seemed to be the worst of circumstances and turned them into good news. So trust the grace of God. Don't put trust in yourself. Don't put trust in your abilities, your schemes, your plans. Don't put your trust in your money, your gov- the government or a job. Put your trust in the grace of God. And then last thing, rest and rejoice in God's grace. Christian thinker and writer Harry Blameyer said, in the Christian life, nothing, nothing at all can be purchased at the do-it-yourself shop. Man, is that good news for me. Um, I have a long, unhappy history with do-it-yourself, but the grace of God is not about do-it-yourself. We need to put away our ledgers, put away our calculators, stop keeping the books. All our efforts to keep the books will do is cause us to be stressed, proud, frustrated, hypocritical, tired, eventually resentful of God. They will never bring peace, and they will never enable us to rejoice in our relationship with God. We are not accepted by God by what we do. We never have been. We never will be. Our assets, in fact, are liabilities. We will not lose God's love and acceptance because of our liabilities because God's grace is sufficient, and we need to rest in that. Sky Jathani is a speaker and a writer and a pastor He says he's not really a baseball fan, but he had an interesting experience a few years back. He uh, attended the induction ceremony at the Baseball Hall of Fame in Cooperstown, New York. Uh, Not only that, not only did he go to that ceremony that day, but the night before, he uh, was invited to a private red carpet reception at the Baseball Hall of Fame. He had his picture taken with Cal Ripken, who is a Hall of Fame, former Baltimore Orioles shortstop, who holds the record, still holds the record, for most consecutive games played in Major League Baseball, 2,632. Says he got to chill with former Dodger great manager Tommy Lasorda. He had a great conversation with Johnny Bench, 14-time All-Star catcher. Had a great time visiting with Andre Dawson, Wade Boggs, Carlton Fisk, all Hall of Famers. 
And he says he has friends who would have killed to have his place at that party and to hobnob with all of those men. And he did nothing to earn his place there. How was it he was invited? Well, it turns out that one of the uh, inductees into the Hall of Fame that year was an old-timer named Deacon White. He was an amazing athlete who was a very early superstar in baseball who played in the 1870s. And Jathani happens to be married to Deacon White's great-great-granddaughter. And that's why he was invited to that reception. He was there not because of anything he did, but because of what someone else had done a long time before he lived. And that's how we end up in God's kingdom. We aren't there because of what we've done, but because of what Jesus has done for us. We don't stay in God's kingdom because of anything we do or don't do. We are in God's kingdom and in his love because of what Jesus has already done for us. So let's relax and enjoy the party. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that you are a gracious God, the God of all grace. It's your characteristic, your nature to give grace. And Father, nothing is more apparent than that reality when we see that the, um, the centerpiece of your work, the main point of your work in all of creation was the greatest act of grace that will ever happen. Father, um, we need your grace, and we thank you that you have given it to us in Jesus Christ. Help us, Lord, then, to rely only upon your grace, to not rely upon our abilities, our strengths, our cleverness, but to trust in your grace, to trust in your grace wholly, for your kingdom so that we can rest and enjoy being in your presence, that we can be drawn to you with joy and peace uh, rather than keeping up a front. Help us to rest so much in your grace that that's how we relate to other people as well, that we don't need to prove anything to them. We don't have to crusade and be better than anybody. We can just be at peace with who we are in Christ and that we can extend to them the same grace that you have extended to us. Thank you, Father, for your grace. We praise you, Lord, as our gracious God. We pray this in the name of our Lord Jesus. Amen. So we want to encourage you to um, uh, continue uh, supporting the Anchor Church. Um, you can look on the Facebook page. There's a little button there you can go to to continue uh, giving and we really do thank you for uh, how you've provided for us and we do love you all and uh, we encourage you to join us again next Sunday morning. We'll start music at 10:20, uh, like we did today and hope you can enjoy hope, hope you enjoy that uh, and we hope to have some word on maybe an opportunity for us all to get together and just enjoy at least in some way outside um, socially distanced uh, being together for a few minutes and encouraging one another. So stay tuned to that. Love you all. Thanks for being with us today.